Hey everybody, uh, Steve here, and uh, today is uh, uh, story time, and the story is about uh, my friend Charlie Watts. And as anybody watching this video knows, Charlie passed away just recently at the age of 80, and uh, everybody, myself, and many, many, many hundreds, thousands of people, are very sad that that has occurred. Uh, I knew Charlie. And, uh, you know, what, what happens at a time like this is everybody uh, talks about what a great contribution he made to rock and roll music, which is true. Uh, I would like to kind of talk a little bit more about, uh, I'll call it the, the human side, and the side that maybe people wouldn't get to see that much. And uh, there are some fun stories in there as well, and I think it's, it's nice to have different things to listen to when you go through a period of loss like this. Some things bring a smile to your face. That's worth something. Uh, here's the first one that I think is, is worth a smile. Uh, a person who's a very dear friend of mine who knew Charlie for well over 30 years and uh, worked with him quite a bit uh, said to me, the, the outpouring of, of, of acknowledgement and uh, of Charlie's contributions is great, but if Charlie were here, he would be saying, what a bloody fuss. And uh, I was really, uh, I, I laughed at that. It was, and it's true. Uh, Charlie would be sitting here saying, it's I'm not a big deal. What's all the fuss about? Um, so it's particularly charming. Charlie was a very, very, uh, had a very, Nice but dry uh, sense of humor and a sharp wit. It was uh, it was great. So anyway, uh, what I wanted to do here is um, focus a little more on different things here. Uh, one of the things that uh, I th I think is important here is that I want to talk about how I interacted with Charlie, what my observations were, and how I felt about about him and what he did. Uh, back when I first met Charlie. It's got to be 2006, maybe it was. Uh, he was in my shop, and, and he purchased some vintage drums from me. He was a very huge fan of vintage drums and uh, drums owned by the people who he respected as a player. And he was a great fan of all jazz music, as we know. He's a great jazz drummer and uh, appreciated Ellington, Basie, Charlie Parker. Uh, the, the list goes on and on and on. So anyway, on this particular visit, when I first met him, he bought some items from me, and he was on, they were on tour, and he, I said, well, we'll send them over, and he said, okay, send them over, and he said, but you don't have to hurry, I won't see them for a year, maybe 18 months, and it got me to thinking, well, that's kind of a drag, why don't I take some pictures, which I did, I took pictures of all the items he bought, I got them printed off onto little three by five printed cards, and I put them in a little book, and when um, we went to the, to the gig uh, that next night, and went backstage, I, I gave Charlie the book, and I said, these are the items you bought. And he looked at the, at the book, and he really liked it, and then he handed the book back to me. I said, no, it's for you. Uh, you bought these items, and you're not going to see them for a year, year and a half. You ought to have something with you that says, hey, here's the great stuff, the cool stuff I just bought. And he was, he was so thankful and so... Uh, just it, it was wonderful. No ego, and, and there never was any ego. And it was a, a wonderful thing. And it was it was a, it was a nice a nice gesture on our part to give that to him. But most people would expect that or demand it or whatever. Charlie didn't even think about it, and he wanted to give me the book back like it was a book I had that was for me. It was for him. So anyway, um, that kind of led uh, a process where Charlie had bought a lot of items. Uh, over the course of time, and that process started him purchasing a lot of things from me over the course of time. And at one point, uh, there were so many things over there that uh, I was asked to go over and try to put some order to it. And uh, when I went over there, there were literally hundreds of boxes stacked up with no rhyme or reason, no order whatsoever. And the reason I bring this up is it leads to two little fun side stories. So I spent the, a two-week trip just unboxing things, cataloging things, doing appraisals on them, photographs, everything, so that there, there could be order to this collection. But when I was over there, one of the things I, um, I said, I said, 
I called and I said, Charlie, whatever happened to your Ludwig Sky Blue Pearl kit, the one that he used in the very, very early days with the stones? And he said, oh, he said, you know, that got given away at some point, I think, and somebody recovered it, and it's, it's gone. I said, oh, that's, that's, that's too bad. That's too bad. So I'm crawling around, literally crawling around, on, around these boxes, and over in a corner, I see three boxes stacked up, and I, I go over and I pull them down, and scribbled on each box says, my first drum set. So I open up those boxes, and inside those boxes was the Ludwig Sky Blue Pearl kit. So it hadn't gone anywhere. It was right there. So I picked up the phone and, and called him, and uh, he came right over, and I said, you got to look at this. And I showed it to him, and he was so, so appreciative and so happy because he said, in, the, in his own words, he says, me dad bought that for me on higher credit. So, you know, it's a kit that his father bought for him, and he thought it was gone, so that was a very, very special, uh, special moment for him. And that was a, it was a fun thing for me, too, to be able to, to find that and provide it to him. In and along the same lines, he had bought uh, many other things, and one of the times I was back, all of these were, were in this, this particular storage area, and he never got to see them uh, very much, uh, never mind to actually play them. So one time we went back, and uh, during the course of a day, I brought out a kit that he bought that had been uh, a Gretsch kit that he got from me that had belonged to Mel Lewis. Burgundy Sparkle, 12, 14, 20 with the snare drum, and I set it up for him. Uh, I set up a couple of kits, and when he came over, I said, here, you can actually play on Mel's kit, which, of course, he didn't feel worthy doing, but it was... Uh, it was fun. He had a good time with it. and It was an opportunity for him to enjoy these things that he had uh, acquired. So that, I, got a, I got a great, uh, great thrill out of that. But, um, you know, he also, uh, talking about this, I want to talk about his, more with his personality and his generosity. And there are things that, that people don't know, and I wouldn't have talked about necessarily publicly while he was still alive out of respect for him. And, but, People need to understand and realize how generous he was. Uh, Charlie had his own line of Vic Firth drumsticks, and you know Vic asked him, uh, "Well, where do you want me to send the money?" And uh, Charlie said, uh, "Send it to Joe Morello." And Joe was a very important person to Charlie. Joe really respected Charlie's uh, Charlie really respected Joe and Joe's ability behind the drum set, which Charlie never actually aspired to do, but he appreciated the way Joe approached the set and Joe's musical approach and his use of space in his solos like Take Five and the like. So uh, Charlie was a big fan of Joe's. Charlie also knew that Joe and his wife Jean did not have ideal living circumstances and times were very hard for them. And so uh, this was a kind of a private way for him to help Joe which was a beautiful thing. Um, over the course of time, a good friend of mine, Danny Gottlieb, uh, who was a, a, a student of Joe's and a, a, a disciple of Joe's for, for a long, long time, and he uh, got in touch with me and said that, uh, you know, Joe had some, his symbols from the 60s that he would like to sell. So I, uh, I got those, and by the same token, at the same time, uh, I talked with Joe, and Joe was able to finally get his 60s era Silver Sparkle Ludwig kit back from uh, Dave Brubeck. Uh, it had been in storage since he had left the band in 67. So those things uh, were items that I was going to sell for Joe to help him. And I, I called Charlie, and I said, Charlie, I have these items. And without any hesitancy at all, he said, I'll absolutely take them. He bought them, and that uh, gesture provided life-changing uh, financial uh, security for Joe and Gene. And Joe was still alive at the time, so he, uh, he really, really appreciated that. At one point later on, uh, after Joe had passed, uh, Charlie was playing in New York, and we did arrange for Gene, uh, Joe's wife, to, to come and meet with Charlie, and he, he really enjoyed that meeting with her and told her how much he loved Joe and Joe's playing. So that was a nice circle to close there. But again, it's a, 
it's a nice story, and it, it talks to the generosity of, of that person. He's a very, very caring individual. Uh, you know, so there are, there, gosh, there are so many things to talk about, but one of the things, uh, there were so many items in his collection that at one point I said to, to, uh, to Charlie, I said, why don't we, these should be in a museum, number one, so they could be on display, and we talked about that, and uh, it never got any farther, but we also talked about doing a, a book, and with the book it would be uh, his famous, uh, the, the famous kits from the famous players that he respected, his background on, you know, what he loved about those particular musicians, and then my backstory on how the item that, that Charlie has for that musician came, came to be through me to him. And we worked on that for quite a while, and one of the things that I remember as a very fond memory is um, as we were working on that, I, I went to his his flat in town and sat with him for about three hours and all we did was talk about this and when you walked in one of the beautiful things was on on the walls everywhere was uh, were pictures of everybody Ellington Basie Charlie Parker uh, famous drummers but not just drummers jazz musicians people who meant something to him Coltrane Miles on and on and on and they were everywhere and it was re you could tell it was really, really important to him. That's, that was a love, and that jazz music re really fed his soul. It was, uh, was great. And we sat, and we sat in his kitchen. And again, uh, you know, this is, uh, you're gonna use the term rock star, you can. Uh, it's true, but this is probably the most humble and, uh, oh, I don't know, <sighs> the most humble rock star of all time, period. Uh, so we sat in his kitchen and we, we drank espresso while we talked for about three hours about all of these different musicians and drummers. And uh, from an espresso machine in little espresso cups, little chipped espresso cups, little chips out of them. No big fancy anything, just plain old sit down in the kitchen and have some espresso and have a conversation. It was a, a moment I will never forget. Let's put it that way. So we, uh, let me, what else should we talk about here? Oh, gosh. Uh, the, the conversation that we had about these drummers was to uh, take form of, in a, in, of a book. And uh, back around 2013, in December of 2013, I actually finished the foreword and four chapters of it and sent it along uh, so that Charlie could read it, and you know, we we never got any farther than that. His life gets in the way, and you know, things go one way for him, things go one way for me. Uh, but it was uh, it was a fun uh, opportunity, and I still have all my notes from the discussions we had. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting about Charlie, he, you know, we, people also said he didn't like he didn't like the spotlight, and that's and that's very true. Uh, I, I remember. At one time, the, uh, when they did the Crossfire Hurricane film, there was a debut of that film in New York City. This was 2012. And um, at that time, there was a, you know, there was a premiere, and, and so he was there, with, uh, Ron and, and uh, Mick and, and Keith, and uh, they were at the premiere, and then there was an after party that uh, we had been invited to. So we go down to the after party, and uh, the... Um, we were sitting talking, and I was saying to one of my guys, Jess Birch, who works in New York shop with me, I said to Jess, I said, I'll bet you Charlie doesn't come. Because uh, Charlie really didn't like being around large crowds of people. So uh, about 20, 30 minutes later, uh, Dale, the fellow who did security for Charlie, uh, walked in, and I said, uh, he's not coming in, is he? He said, uh, nope. Uh, and, and at this time, you have to keep in mind, uh, Charlie's granddaughter, Charlotte, was in to visit. And Charlotte was very young at the time, uh, maybe 17. Uh, I met her once uh, since then. She's, she's lovely and uh, a wonderful person. But she was really young at this time. So Charlie, uh, Dale said, Charlie came up in the elevator with him. Elevator doors open, and Charlie said, I can't do this. I'm going back to the whole hotel. And he said to Dale, he said, you look after Charlotte to make sure she was okay. 
So, um, you know, he just shied away from that. Um, there was another interesting little thing that uh, he, you know, he loved the gig with the Stones, obviously, but jazz is what fed his soul, his musical soul. So at one point in um, 2012, they, uh, the Stones were on their tour, but Charlie was in New York City with his band A, B, C, and D of Boogie Woogie. So it was um, a wonderful, wonderful event because he did a week at the Iridium Jazz Club in New York City. And during that week, there was a concert, an outdoor concert at Lincoln Center featuring them as well. And one of the things I told people is, I don't think I ever saw Charlie smile more than when he was sitting and playing in that group. And there are many pictures from that. Uh, I put one up on my tribute on the, on the website article. Uh, and there, were, um, there was, I think it was the New York Times, did a review of the concert. And there are several pictures there of him sitting behind the black uh, Gretsch Bob kit. It's actually my kit that I loaned him. <coughs> it's there. And he, uh, he's smiling and beaming. And he was like that the whole time. That entire uh, event was just wonderful. And one night at the Iridium, Charlie had uh, his uh, slightly panicky moment because uh, Roy Haynes came to visit and was sitting in the audience. Uh, and I remember Charlie going, bloody hell, I've got to do something now because Roy's in the audience. <laughs> And it was, uh, it, it, was, it, was a funny, it was a funny moment, but, you know, Charlie had a ball during that entire uh, event, and it was, uh, it was great to, to see him there. There was a little funny sidebar story on this. The, uh, uh, Charlie brought his cymbals with him, and that includes that little 18-inch uh, flat ride that he uses with the stones. And uh, I said, what are you going to do with your cymbals? You can't just leave them here overnight. So I, I took them back and forth with me uh, to where I lived. I lived in, in town, maybe a few blocks, six or eight blocks away. And so I would take the symbols at the end of the night and walk back to my, uh, to my apartment with them. And then on the second night, it kind of dawned on me. I said, you know, I'm walking down the streets of Midtown with a lot of money in terms of valuable collectible symbols that Charlie uses, especially that flat ride with the stones. And after that, um, a friend of ours who works with NYPD uh, arranged for someone to take me from uh, the venue back to my apartment each night with those symbols so that nothing, uh, nothing would happen to them. It was kind of funny. But, um, you know, when I think about all of this, uh, there's another little thing, another little thing. Okay, so uh, Charlie made a comment about how he always loved to sketch. And he made a comment that he always sketched the, the bed of every hotel room that he stayed in. And during this time, this, this period in 2012 when he was in town, he used to love to stay at the uh, uh, Mandarin Oriental Hotel. And I went there to meet him one day, but you know, rather than come down the lobby, it would be a little bit too much commotion. So I went up to his, his room. And uh, you know, he didn't have a big massive suite, modest room, but right there was the sketchbook open and he had the sketch of the bed from the room there, which was, uh, which is interesting. I mean, he just, uh, he just loved to do it. It's what kept him busy. And uh, there's one, one little sidebar I have. Charlie, okay, Charlie is uh, widely known as one of the best dressed men on the planet, okay, with the bespoke suits and, and everything. So uh, always very dapper and very proper and look fantastic all the time. So I got one of the greatest compliments I ever got in my whole life came from Charlie. So Charlie, this is the man who goes, gets everything tailor-made, handmade, and everything else. Now, I, I happen to wear uh, cowboy boots. That's what I wear. I had a particular pair of boots I wore, and I was out there visiting with him one time, and he looked at me and he said, I like your boots. So I'm mean, coming from Charlie. That's a compliment to beat all compliments. I saved those boots. They're all worn out now, but I saved them. I'm not giving those away. So Charlie liked those boots. They're staying with me. So uh, gosh, I don't know. We covered a lot of territory here. A lot of uh, just, you know, kind of different little bits and tidbits that you, uh, you might not hear elsewhere. And I hope that they're enjoyable. And I think in the end, one of the things I, I know for a fact, Charlie lived a um, long, full life. He loved his family. 
He loved his music. And uh, I think, you know, you have to keep that in mind. It was a good run. That's a really good run. And we're all going to miss him for sure. But there's a lot left behind and a lot of fond memories. I'm not the only one that has fond memories. A lot of people do. I think it's important that we share those with people so that they can also get some comfort. You know, you have the sadness of someone being gone, but then you also start to share fond memories and happy stories and funny stories. And it starts to let you balance the whole thing out and you can deal with it and cope with it better. So uh, I hope this was enjoyable. And uh, of course, if anybody's got any questions, you always know how to reach me. Vintage drums at AOL.com. Come straight to me. I answer any questions you have on anything, anytime. Thanks, everybody.